When there is increased volatility in the market, there's more opportunity to make more money if you play it right than when the market has less volatility. And similarly, when there's just increased volatility in, say, geopolitics as a whole, there's more ability for more significant grabs of power than there are when things are more equilibrious. And so the saying, never let a good uh, crisis go to waste, um, sometimes crises are just completely made up, right? They're false flagged. Sometimes they're not false flagged, but they are, they just naturally emerge. And then uh, some agents are more focused to see how they can advance the agendas they already had, utilizing the dynamics of that situation rather than try to fix the situation. So let's say, for instance, that I was one of the many people that got good intelligence uh, back in early January about what was happening in Wuhan and how many people, five to seven million people left Wuhan before quarantine and that uh, they got on planes, not to the rest of China, but to the rest of the world. And uh, what was likely to happen from that? So we see some senators that sold stock in January, right? But that's a small part, like those are formal intelligence briefings to people who have classified access, but the private intelligence agencies largely work for hedge funds and financial institutions and things like that, and they're looking at the same information. Um, so if I run a hedge fund and I see that there's a situation that could have meaningful downturn to the economy, but I can make money when the economy goes down and we're already at the top of an, you know, a stock market that's probably about as high as it can be because the underlying economy is actually very unhealthy, right? The total percent of GDP that's going to debt servicing is unsustainably high. The wealth inequality is unsustainably disparate. Um, it's basically a power law distribution. You have a few companies that make up most of the success of the stock market because it's cap weighted and then almost everything else pretty profoundly lagging. Um, you have a totally unsustainable amount of total debt and all of that's resulted in the need for ongoing quantitative easing and a negative yielding bond market and totally weird stuff like that, right? And so <clears throat> the market's not going to keep going up and staying that high forever anyways. And uh, so being able to have that foreknowledge and say now is a good time to sell these stocks. And by the way, let's actually short a bunch of stuff to make money as the market goes <coughs> – excuse me – to make money as the market goes down. And then the value is going to get really low if – if airlines can't fly, the price of airlines is going to get really low. But airlines are a real thing the world's going to need. The value of that's not just going to evaporate. So being able to buy it up at hugely discounted prices before it goes back up is pretty awesome opportunity to consolidate power. And let's say that I have large pools of liquid capital and I haven't – so I'm a family office or a sovereign wealth fund. <clears throat> it has been hard to deploy that capital very effectively for a while because I've got negative interest yielding – you know, bond markets, I can't just make interest by sitting on it. And, um, you know, there hasn't been huge volatility of the type that could be very effective and market stock market prices were high, but now you can deploy that capital very effectively, uh, by being able to buy up real valuable utilities at a very discounted price. Also, if I am interested in increased surveillance capitalism or increased surveillance state or just concentration of power of any kind, um, when things get worse, people become more willing to accept solutions that have some consequences. And so I don't even have to do anything to make it bad. I simply have to <clears throat> uh, not make it better. Say we're working on it and bureaucracies are slow <laughs> until we get to the position that we actually have the capability to uh, do something. And so, and if I'm trying to advance a geopolitical agenda and I really want an alliance with these countries who are currently allied somewhere else, and I can just to help the situation break those alliances, like all of those types of things, I, I'm not saying anyone did anything. I'm saying that these are reasonable things to understand that there's an incentive landscape for. 
right? Now, someone who, people who own hedge funds or large pools of capital, if they had the intelligence of what was happening. Could they, if they wanted to, maximally help and, you know, try to start engaging solutions and trying to use some of that money to influence governments to say, hey, let's actually put these travel bans on sooner and let's um, start getting test kits rolled out and PPE distributed and et cetera. Of course they could, and they can say it's not their job. And it's not their job, right? Their job is to maximize return for the assets under management for their shareholders, which they do a very good job of. Do I think that's a conspiracy? Do I think they intended the virus? No, but I think that their incentive is to do predatory opportunism more than it is to solve the problem. I think the vast majority of what we're seeing is just predatory opportunism. Um, I don't think it's all just that. And so if you think about the power law distribution of wealth, you have a few actors who have really just a small number. Like if you look at the House of Saud and the House of Rothschild and Putin's personal wealth, it's kind of like way above everybody else's, right? And then you've got like a small but larger set of 100 billionaires. And, and then it you know, kind of falls steeply. In the same way that there is a power law distribution in wealth, there's a power law distribution in geopolitical power and in hybrid warfare power. And so the few actors that have the most asymmetric capacity have it by being good at gaining and maintaining asymmetric capacity. They didn't get it by like lottery, right? And so to think that the actors that have the most asymmetric capacity have it for any reason other than they're the best at gaining asymmetric capacity is naive. And so do those actors have more ability to influence the overall landscape to continue to advance asymmetric power? Yeah. Um, is it guaranteed what will happen? No, it's a high stakes kind of uh, situation. So someone could ask, I'm not going to say anything here. It's not relevant about specific actors. But what I can say is if you have any actors that you are curious about, uh, you can just say, okay, let's make a list starting in whenever, starting in November or December of the things that the WHO said or the CDC said or whatever group you want to look at or President Trump or whomever and say, look at the things that they said and the things that they did <clears throat> chronologically in time relative to what would have actually been the right thing to do and made sense. And then just look at the delta between those. And then just try to explain the delta. Some of it totally might be incompetence. Some of it totally might be bureaucracy. And just look at, does, it, does that seem to account for all of it? I mean, there are very basic examples. The WHO was telling people not to wear PPE until not that long ago. And... Um, Trump was saying, "This we've got this solved. This isn't a big deal until it was almost overwhelming U.S. cities, right? And um, Ch Beijing shut down flights from Wuhan to the rest of China, but didn't shut down flights from Wuhan to the rest of the world. There are a bunch of studies that are in process by major public health organizations that are looking at the drugs that are currently interesting, the antivirals, but only doing late stage trials of the antivirals, particularly of antivirals that are uh, generic. So there's, a, there's one particular study that is looking at hydroxychloroquine late stage with vitamin C as the placebo. I'm not gonna say which group it is, but <clears throat> it's easy to find out. Vitamin C is not a placebo. Vitamin C is extremely well established for having uh, antiviral benefits, actually even in late stage, more than most pharmaceuticals do. And 
one can expect at late stage wouldn't be effective anyways. So maybe that's just a dumb study. Maybe it's just a badly designed study. But if I wanted to say, look, Trump was an idiot, or I wanted to say, see this generic drug we can't make any money on doesn't work, so this other drug or vaccine that we have is the only option. And so I wanted to have a particular result come out looking like science, but it's actually not science because it's science being set up to produce a particular result. I would consider that info warfare pretending to be science. Um, is it that or not? I can say if I wanted to do info warfare, I would do it that way. Um, so just because something's a randomized control trial done by a prestigious university, does it mean that it's good information? No. Uh, this, this is a very important topic. Now here's another important topic, legitimate authority. Legitimate authority is a very powerful thing, right? Because if there is something that seems like a source of legitimate authority that can, uh, decide what policy should be or, uh, control public opinion, then the power of that is such that any group that is seeking the power to influence policy or control uh, public opinion would have maximum incentive to try to influence that legitimate authority. And so we have no problem seeing this in retrospect, right? We, we have no problem seeing uh, the way that priestly authority during the Middle Ages was very influenced by uh, the kings and banks and whatever that were all basically playing different aspects of power games. And so whether we're talking about legitimate authority that comes from a religious source or a science source or a one thing that you'll learn about science. And this was, this is kind of a postmodern critique, but not quite because there, there's a more earnest way to take it. The more complex the physical system, the easier it is to get very different answers based on how you set up the study. And so the larger the data set is, the easier it is to cherry pick data that supports whatever I want, where it's actually not lying, it's just cherry picked. But similarly, if I'm looking at something as complex as a cell or a body, there's no way I can test everything that is relevant to that thing, right? So I can say, well, this particular biometric went up and that's a measure of health. There might be plenty of other biometrics that also went up that are measures of illness or that went down that are measures of health, but they aren't even things that we look at in the study. And so I can do info warfare very well with complexity because I can say, what is the thing that I want to say to advance whatever the narrative or the agenda is? And I can make something that looks like science that says that thing. So just, just because uh, something looks like science, can you trust that it is true? No. You actually really have to look at the preponderance of data. You have to look at how the methodology was done. You have to look at who funded it. You've got, like, there's a lot of things. And as the situation gets more complex, the more so. So basic physical chemistry inside of a beaker or how a transistor works is very, very different than how a cell works. Um, now, does that mean that all authorities are run by lizard people uh, to install 5G nanobots and make us part of the AI matrix? No, it doesn't mean that. And that's one of the other things is people jump to um, kind of maximally paranoid uh, pattern matching. Do I think that SARS-CoV-2 is a virus? meaning a actual physical infectious agent that is not just the result of bioterrain or somebody's own endogenous exosome when it's exposed to 5G or something like that. Yes, I think it is a virus. And I think that it's very well established if you... We have uh, been able to actually look at the shape and structure of the virus in lots of different universities independently and um, in samples from people and whatever um, and compare it to other coronaviruses and to SARS-CoV-1 and to look at how it would have evolved into being and the relationship with 
bats and other things. Do I think that 5G causes coronavirus? No. Do I think that the people who have COVID symptoms are really some other thing caused by 5G? No. The look, if you do look at a map of the distribution of 5G and a map of the distribution of SARS or, or of, uh, excuse me, of uh, COVID-19, they don't match. There are areas that have 5G that were not terribly hit and there are areas that were terribly hit that don't have 5G. So I saw a number of studies that rolled out, or not studies, like memes that rolled out that said, look, here are the places that were hit and these were all a month after 5G was installed or the first place had 5G or whatever. And they were just actually wrong. Like when I went and looked at it, they, like it was pretty compelling. So I'm like, wow, if that's true, it, it was not true. Um, and so this is just like basic fact checking. Um, do I think that there are companies that are extremely powerful companies that are extremely focused on rolling 5G out? Yes. I think Huawei and Verizon in particular, some other ones, have very deep investment in 5G. Do I think that the safety of it is well enough established to roll it out? No. But I think that on some of the previous uh, wireless communication too. And I also think it on the cumulative load of the total thing. So the fact that it's not ionizing radiation is not the only relevant thing. Yes, that means that it's not like acutely causing you cancer like a microwave. Um, but it's signal. It's transmitting signal. Does Is signal transmission something that's happening in your brain and between cells that is a part of how the communication of a biological organism works? Yes. Is there is it reasonable to think that there um, could be interference? Yeah. Should it be on the burden of the activists to prove that it's unsafe or the burden of the telecom companies to prove that it's safe before being rolled out? The burden of proof should absolutely be on proving safety. Um, do we need it? No, we don't need it. Well, we need it for the economy to grow. No, it's gibberish. Um, do we need it because we need an IOT connected smart city world that fast? No. Do we like fast shit and like we want to get to self-driving cars and whatever? Yeah, we totally do. Now is 5G based on the frequency bands and everything going to be more dangerous or not than 4G? I haven't done the studies. I haven't to know. Um, I can say that just intuitively, I have concerns about it. And I believe that once it's rolled out, it'll be impossible to do proper studies because you won't be able to isolate it anymore. You won't be able to get to environments where it's not without changing your whole life so much that you've changed enough other variables that you can't say like, oh yes, when you're in the Arctic Circle, um, your health issues change, but was that because now you're in a pristine environment air wise or water wise or different sun or, and so uh, I think I would much rather that we were doing the right kinds of safety studies up front that weren't only looking at acute effects, but chronic effects. This is something that I'm very upset about our entire medical paradigm is um, the topic of toxicity in general and deficiency of nutrient and pathogenicity in terms of uh, infection, we don't look at chronic subclinical issues enough. So we have a clinical definition of, uh, okay, here is, you have a, you have a clinical vitamin D deficiency, right? You, you've got rickets. Well, here's the level of rickets or you, you have a clinical vitamin C deficiency. You have scurvy. Well, pretty much nobody gets scurvy right? Like you have to be in some fucked up food situation to get scurvy, which is why there are still a lot of kind of mainstream doctors who say you don't need supplements and nobody really needs vitamin C or vitamin D or whatever it is. But then you have what is the optimal level for human thriving and the healthiest people with the healthiest diets. And there's a pretty big range between the optimal level and scurvy. And if you're here, your docs are going to say you're not deficient, 
but you might actually be, and, but the deficiency means you are now acutely dying, right? You are in an acute death process directly related to this one identifiable thing. But above that, you might be in a, you will probably live less long and have increased susceptibility to different kinds of diseases, but you'll never be able to track it to this because it's your subclinical level of vitamin C plus of vitamin D plus of a bunch of other things, plus of toxicities, plus of whatever, right? It's basically just um, suboptimal dynamics that support overall system homeodynamics. When we're looking, if we're only looking at, does this cause an immediate acute one for one thing to be able to say this was a necessary and sufficient cause of a disease? That's just a broken model, which is why I think in modern medicine, we're quite good at solving acute causation things. If someone gets an acute poisoning or an acute injury or an acute infection, we're actually pretty good at that. But when it comes to complex chronic illness, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease, uh, psychiatric disease. We don't have much in the way of real cures for those things. We have symptomatic treatments and we have things that can stop certain parts of the disease pathology progression. But that's because it doesn't have a single cause and the cause, the many causes aren't even the same ones. They're different causes and different people and they're very delayed in time. So there's a whole new model of medicine that's needed for that. But if I'm doing safety studies looking for a near-term cause, which I would always, if I am a company wanting to advance something, I don't want to be testing something for 30 years. I don't want to be looking at the long-term all-cause mortality um, associated with the thing. So there's a very real question of how do we advance, like how do we advance new things where the negative effects might be very causally delayed? Um But then this is where we also have to think about risk and necessity and things like that. So do I think that the safety studies that are done are based on the wrong model of safety? Yes, I think it's the wrong model of safety. Now, do I think that there is a that 5G is a mind control system to kind of brown noise everybody's mind and to activate vaccine implanted nanochips and whatever? I've never... I mean, it's an interesting idea. If there was any group that was actually that well-coordinated and powerful, that would also be kind of interesting. I have never seen any evidence that is compelling. When I followed some of those rabbit holes, the, the evidence that, that I have been able to find is not compelling. That doesn't mean it's not true, right? I'm not closing the door on that's for sure not true. Maybe there are reptilians running shit, but I have no evidence to believe so, and it seems exceedingly unlikely. Something that's actually a very interesting thing to do is to look at declassified documents of things that were conspiracy theories in the past that now we actually know happened because the documents got declassified. And so, um, you know, there were several in the Vietnam area. The Gulf of Tonkin is a very famous one, um, but also the firing torpedoes into the water and saying that we had sunk Vietnamese ships to increase the uh, escalation for the war and um, things about Operation Mockingbird, uh, Operation Paperclip, uh, COINTELPRO. There's like there's a number of things that are now declassified because those people all died. Um, and where during the time that it was still happening, anyone who said anything about it would be a conspiracy nut. And so, and similarly, when, um, when the USSR fell, there was a bunch of declassified stuff that came out in Baltic states. I have a friend that runs a private intelligence company who went to Yugoslavia and pulled the intelligence records then and looked at the way that the KGB built their system of DSM to be able to classify anything that went against the state as a mental illness. And it was like very clearly documented how they did it and the ideas behind it. And um, the whole thing about the way that J. Edgar Hoover was targeting the Black Panthers and all like that, that wouldn't have been known except that, you know, people broke in and found the shit, right? Um, so does that stuff happen? Yeah, of course it happens. And it happens in the 
public sector, meaning government, intelligence agencies, uh, you know, military. It also happens in the private sector, right? So for when you see the Enron type things, for every Enron, there's a lot of those that happen all the time that just aren't caught. And for every Madoff and whatever. <clears throat> that said, most of the common conspiracy theories that I see are things that I can't find any good grounding for. Um, and they're like, many of them tend to be far more fantastical um, than just the kind of typical social science of, yes, of course, groups with really big budgets probably have more advanced tech than is publicly known about. And yes, of course, for national security purposes, some shit is kept secret. And they're actually engaged in war and preparation for war. And so, um, and yes, like the people that get to the top of power stacks get there by being good at getting to the top of power stacks. And that means a bunch of things psychologically in the disposition. Because there will be sociopaths that will want to overturn them, and they will only not get overturned by the draconian measures of the sociopaths if they are better at being able to play that game than they are. You know, we can talk about conspiracy as a function of the system incentives, right? Whatever it is the system incentivizes creates a kind of topology. And the people just kind of move within the shape of that topology. But then they in turn shape the topology. So there's a, there's a reinforcing thing. And one of the problems is that like sociopaths and sadists are a real thing. And people who are not that actually have a hard time believing that because they have empathy and they are empathizing with what it must be like to be someone else. So they're getting wrong. They have a hard time putting themselves in the position of someone whose inner experience is as different from theirs as it actually is. But, um, you know, when you look at cluster B disorders, there's a whole set of disorders that are oriented to power and including abuses of power. So there are not one for one and perfect, not every time, but statistical correlation with positions of high power and psychologies that are oriented to want that. And that means also differential and asymmetric power, meaning use increased power over others to continue to grow and maintain asymmetric power. Um, it's funny how easy it is to see throughout history, right? Like when we're looking at Genghis Khan or Alexander the Great or Napoleon or whatever, we're like, oh yeah, the... Those guys just went and killed fucking everybody, right? And yet then when we look at the people who are most powerful today, they're genetically the same kinds of people who – and we have a situation that in some ways seems more civil, but also in some ways just because we hide it better. You know, like we had a nice Democrat in pres presidency in the U.S. and we drone striked a lot of civilians and uh, for very questionable – actual motives. And, um, and factory farms are as gruesome as anything that was done in the dark ages at a massive scale that almost everybody watching this is paying to make that happen. Right. So it's like, Oh, I didn't kill her. I paid a hitman. Well, okay. You fucking paid to have the wet works done. Well, buying something that comes from a factory farm is that, right? You're like paying someone else to do this kind of gruesome wet works. And uh, so the reason I say this is because I want to see us emerge into the higher angels of our nature. But we can only do that if we can also face the reality of the total set of things that the human experience does. And specifically, some of the uglier things that it does and the relationship to power that that ends up getting. And um, now, one can also take that too far, take that as a general set of principles and assume that everyone in a position of power is a child-eating sadist, uh, Satanist, which would also be silly. And this is one of the things that I find with regard to conspiracy, is I find that people have an aesthetic bias where anything they hear as a conspiracy they either just kind of reject it 
up front. Oh, fucking tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. They just automat- auto-reject it without studying it, even though history shows how much people have conspired, just meaning some people share info with each other to advance shared agendas without sharing it with the public and sharing some disinfo. You can go back to Sun Tzu and read about disinfo and how to do disinfo, right? Like we've been doing that for thousands of years, pretty intelligently and coordinatedly. Um, and so it's interesting how easy it is for people to reject something as, oh, that's dumb conspiracy thinking when you actually study history. Then on the other hand, there are people who, if they hear any conspiracy, they assume it's probably true. And if they hear that anything came from a authoritative institution, they assume it's probably corrupt. And that's also completely silly because if the groups were that corrupt, they would be overturned. Like if they were that completely and wholesale corrupt. So there is a there is a balance of that it's not just evilness that gets them there. It's also effectiveness at a lot of things, right? It is actually the ability to produce and manage and do logistics and the ability to win power games. It's a mix of those things, right? So is everything coming out of a major university or major institution or, you know, government regulatory body, a lying conspiracy? No. Is a lot of it at least highly influenced? Yeah. Does that mean that most of the people who are involved even know? No, of course not. Most of the people involved are just doing their job. And they were told to research this, so they're doing a good job of doing honest research on this. Now, the fact that they're researching this as opposed to this and that there's an agenda as to why to research this as opposed to that, they will never even know that that agenda. What this means, though, is that almost everyone lives in in a topology that is, you know, like, what do I do for job protection? There are certain things that, like, there's stuff I'm not going to say because I'll lose my job. There's certain stuff I have to say and I have to do to just keep my job. I got to take care of my family. So whatever it is, even if it seems kind of unethical or asshole-ish or not the thing I'd most like to do, it's office policy or whatever. So just for job security and then for promotion and for ladder climbing, uh, I am going to do the thing that's effective within that space. So basically the incentives and the disincentives, the topology of that space is going to inform my action as an average agent in that space. But some people have asymmetric influence on the architecture of those topologies. And so one of the things that I think most people don't think about enough is that a relatively small amount of fairly sociopathic people can create topologies that lots of otherwise not sociopathic people will participate in towards relatively sociopathic results. So let's say that profit becomes a motive for war. If you study history again, the idea that that's a thing becomes pretty clear. And when you look at the size that military industrial complexes out of the total economic block and the size of the government contracts it gets compared to other areas, whatever. And the fact that if the demand went away, the the profit of the supply side would go away. And that it is actually the fiduciary responsibility of all business owners to continue to manufacture demand. Um, we can go back and historically look at cases, right? We can look at Gulf of Tonkin or whatever, where there were false flag events for whatever motives. So let's say there's some fucked up motives that some very small number of people have that end up influencing other people and the other people are not necessarily even aware of what those motives were. The soldier who is in the battlefield isn't fighting for financial interest, who's risking his life and making a relatively low wage, but he still might be doing something that is when he is involved in the in the bombing or the whatever, he still might be killing civilians for wars that should never be fought. And he just doesn't even know that, right? So he's engaged in an overall an activity that we could call a sociopathic activity for non-sociopathic reasons personally. And we can see the same thing in the corporate world. We can see the same thing in all over the place. This was the, the SS troop who were being tried in the Nuremberg trials and how many of them said – no, we actually didn't believe everything we were doing was good. It started out with some ideological stuff and then it got really fucked up. And then when they were asked, did you try to stop? No. And they all repeated the same German phrases that basically said officers orders. We didn't have a choice. And so this property by which, so yes, there's, 
somebody does a really fucked up thing, they don't even make it obvious or they have some fucked up motives and they create a set of office policies or command and control policies or whatever it is. And everyone else is just kind of doing their job. And they're even usually told something that what they're doing is valorous or good, right? Scientists who are told they're doing this for one reason and then it is used for a weaponized purpose inside of military or whatever. Um, and then there's also the, if one actor is developing a new weapon, all the other actors have to develop the new weapon plus counter weapons. There's the arms race side. So both of those are the situations in which bad actors are capable of affecting a incentive landscape that affects lots of other actors. One of the things we will need for an effective civilization is a way to be able to bind bad actors quickly, which will require the kind of transparency to be able to identify that it is actually bad acting when they're seeking to disinform, which is this question of true information versus faulty information. A lot of people have a strong bias towards wanting certainty which means that they will adopt more certainty than the epistemics that they went through should warrant. And this can be for different reasons. It's generally wanting security and conflating security and certainty. And, um, and so recognizing how big of an infinity the unknowable is Everyone has to make very deep friends with uncertainty to not be mentally ill. That doesn't mean that they have to do the move that all there is is uncertainty, nothing can possibly be known, which is also gibberish because the fact that I can't know anything with perfect certainty doesn't mean that I can't know things with much higher relative certainty based on certain epistemic processes that inform right action. So. Uh, do I want some kinds of trials on my drugs before utilizing the drugs as opposed to just pendulum dowsing or guessing? Yes, I, de I definitely do. And are there certain kinds of processes that will give increased certainty to be able to inform certain types of actions based on the consequentiality of those actions? Yes. Does any of that give absolutely perfect certainty? No, because I can't rule out unknown unknowns. But I can certainly say I have enough certainty to inform right action here. And so people having a mature relationship with certainty and uncertainty is that they're not uncomfortable with either. There are a lot of people who have been trained up in more of a postmodernist camp who are actually very uncomfortable with any certainties, even relative ones. Um, and it's, you know, the assumption that all certainty is probably imperialism. Uh, it's probably someone going to try and force their not universal truth as if it was universal under the name of science on everybody or something like that. But there's a lot we can say with pretty high certainty about the molecular properties of water. There really just is, or the speed of sound or a lot, a lot of things that are pretty well established, uh, that are very useful. And it's like, you know, like Dawkins says here, rightly planes actually work, whether you believe in them or not. And there, there's a, there is a reality to the uh, mechanisms um, in those domains. <clears throat> so it's important to be not only able to have certainty where it's warranted, but to seek it, to seek basically better and better understanding of reality to inform more responsible choice making. But in order to do that, I've got to I've got to admit and acknowledge and be comfortable with the amount of uncertainty that's there so that I can assess where I'm currently at and what the appropriate process to come to enough certainty to act is. So I see that same weird certainty on both the conspiracy theorists and the anti-conspiracy theorists. Like there's this in-group thing where one is it would be so bad for my in-group if I was part of the critical thinking anti-conspiracy camp and I started saying, you know, maybe there really is such and such, that there's pretty strong incentives other than just clear thinking against it. Um, there's also other kinds of cognitive biases that we can talk about that are actually pretty important. 
Aliens. I don't fucking know. I have seen some evidence that I find quite compelling of some things. I have seen enough video evidence of objects moving and particularly um, declassified military stuff, not just the recent TikTok, but lots of things. Things that uh, do acute angles at speed, which doesn't go along with inertia as we understand it. Maybe it's just a hologram, which would make sense, right? Because a hologram could do that. Or maybe it's a plasma being moved around by EM fields or something or some kind of directed energy weapon thing. Maybe it is some kind of physical ship, maybe. I don't know. But it when you look at something like the Disclosure Project uh, and all of the military officials, very senior rear admirals and force our generals and whatever that came forward and described the experience that they had with unidentified objects, objects they they couldn't identify. Is that compelling? Yeah, it's totally compelling for me that there is that many of them describing some kinds of phenomena. Does that mean I get to jump to knowing what the phenomena are? Nope. Does that mean there are aliens or there aren't aliens? I don't know. Um, But I, I neither feel comfortable saying, I for sure have a clear sense that it is, or I can for sure rule it out. I can say that a lot of people who understand how to read radar and who understand as fighter pilots or astronauts or whatever, how to identify the types of man-made objects in the sky have seen a lot of things they can't identify uh, that seem earnest as opposed to just lay dumb people. So, That's totally fascinating for me, but I'm comfortable enough with uncertainty to leave it at fascinating and say, if I could figure out more, I would want to. Do I think that there are people that are erring on the side of unfounded conspiracy theories and more of them together and with more certainty? Yes, definitely. Do I think there are also other people erring on the side of being comfortable with more authoritarianism? like the exact opposite side that totally shouldn't be that are actually under paranoid about uh, what the true authorities are telling them and how they will handle things. Yeah. I totally think that both of those are happening nearly equally and equally concerningly. No, I'm actually more concerned by the second one. Honestly, I think that there's a problem with people saying that they think that there isn't really a virus. They can absolutely fuck a pandemic up with that belief. But I think the other people who call for uh, national security actions to solve this that leave authority states also creates a problem that could be worse than the virus. I think there's another reason that people are kind of having that increasing sense is that there are a lot of increasing authoritarian measures happening which is legitimately concerning and should be for anyone who has paid attention to history. And um, I think a lot of people do have the awareness that even if something wasn't intended as a grand plot, that opportunism is a thing. And I don't think that most people think that Facebook and Google want everyone's data for their good you know, for everyone's good. Like they, they commercialize the fuck out of that data in ways that do not necessarily improve the lives of the people. And sometimes might like, they're actually turning the people into a commodity. Um, the other thing is that when you see th- developing nations respond better than the U S which has happened for a number of, of them. And when you see, mm, when you see Vietnam respond better, right? And um, some Latin American countries and whatever, and you see how far ahead we knew this was a thing. And you see the intelligence briefings that were there and the lack of response, and you know what the logistical capabilities of of the US military and DOD that wouldn't even have to override anyone's freedom to just offer logistical support are, And you know how much damage is happening to the economy and how much cheaper it would have been to actually do upfront work and the fact that there weren't tests and that by the time we had got our first 100,000 tests out, Germany had been doing 500,000 a week for a long time with a tiny percentage of the population. 
there's so much of that that a lot of people are like, is that just incompetence? Like, it's almost mind-blowing to imagine that that's just incompetence. Given that we have so much actual fucking competence. Like, the if there's anything the U.S. military is really good at, like, it's really good at logistics. And it doesn't have to be deployed in a way that overrides any civil liberties to simply be deployed to support stuff, to support supply chains and get PPE where it's supposed to go and shit. Why wasn't that? Why didn't that happen? Why didn't we get, you know, and when you look at Germany and its testing, or you look at Hong Kong and the way it shut the borders down, or you look at the way South Korea rolled it out as a democracy, or you look at the way Iceland did, or you look at the, and so, um, and then when you also look at, well, why the fuck did Beijing not let anyone fly from Wuhan to the rest of China, but they did let them fly from Wuhan to the rest of the world. And a number of other very strange things about the flows of PPE and stuff like that. Um, I think that people will jump to the wrong theory. But sometimes because of a right intuition. And the right intuition is there are some agents benefiting from this and I don't feel good about it. And then a rather than being able to sit with the uncertainty long enough to do the right kind of research. So like, did Trump get this wrong for a long time in terms of saying, oh, there's no big deal. We got it handled, whatever. Yes, totally. Does that mean he's driving the whole thing for some agenda for himself super effectively? And it's really because he owns shares in the hydroxychloroquine company. And that's why he said it. Well, I would say that that's not very good conspiracy investigation. The fact that he owns some shares in a financial services company, I think it's like a mutual fund or something, that owns some shares in a company that produces hydroxychloroquine, which is a generic, which means that it doesn't have a patent on it and lots of companies can produce it and there's not much money to be made on it. Eh, like you don't do really good conspiracies for like a few bucks. Um, you, you'd have to, you have to do something better than that. So that's just like a follow the money trail, but not, not that money trail, right? That just doesn't look like a particularly good money trail. Um, so actually the main thing I want with conspiracy theorists is that they get better at it, that they get better at actually studying history and studying sociology and being able to actually check facts and follow a, accounting records and, you know, go read the doctrine of unrestricted warfare to have some sense of what PLA and CCP likely think. whole idea of don't ever explain by malice what can be explained by incompetence that's also an important rule like slow moving stupid internally friction filled bureaucracies like that's a real thing and the fact that we have a lot of systems that are super ossified and are not good at sense making and not agile in their response like that's a real thing so you can certainly ascribe a lot of stuff to that um where there are groups that seem to have good intel and the agentic capacity to act and took the wrong actions, it's more interesting. You still don't necessarily know what the motive was. And this is one of the interesting things about like motive is something that is outside of the domain of the formal methods of science, which is why social science is called the soft science, because I can't measure your motive. I can't do a third person measure and repetition on that measure. Um, well, but can't I measure your brain? Well, we don't really have perfect one for one neural correlates, right? Um, so I can observe your action and then I have to try and infer motive and belief. And the inference is a big step. Um, now maybe you wrote an email and I can find your email and you express it or whatever. So this is where people have to be careful if they actually want to try to do sense making well to just look at where did I make a logical leap and what was my basis to make that leap and how much how much of a what are the different answers that it could be here and let's run all of them and then how do I say for this particular premise how how would I falsify this or verify this or if this was true what other things would be true that I can look for if this was false what other things might be true that I can look for there the certainty of this is just a virus, everybody's doing the best they can, um, the political party I don't like is kind of at fault for the bad response, 
and uh, fuck those guys, but we just need to band together and kind of help our political party win this next time and um, solve the virus and whatever and international participation. The certainty of that or the certainty of uh, we know the cabal that is organizing this whole thing for 5G mind control or whatever, they're both comforting in a certain way. Now, the bias here that I find interesting is there. there's lots of nuance, so I'm going to oversimplify, but I definitely see people that have a towards or away from conspiracy bias that corresponds with their general bias of how they relate to authorities. And like I said, I'm oversimplifying, but the oversimplification is a starting place for me. And I'm going to even postulate where this comes from, but again, not all the time. This, this is a pattern that we can observe enough of the time that it's interesting to look at. The reason I'm careful with saying things like that is because when someone over norms their patterns, that's one of the places that their sense making becomes bad. Um, I have seen relatively often people who generally think that government bodies are kind of lame and ossified and whatever, but mostly regulate in the right interests. You can largely trust authorities. The universities mostly say true stuff, um, whatever things. Those people generally trust the authorities also generally have a frame that things are mostly getting better in the world right now. A lot less people have that frame, but in general that frame and generally not always those people did better in childhood like at school, in sports, they're, oftentimes their parents were either more successful or they did better relative to them. And so they had this experience that the system actually works for me and that the authorities are, are actually trustworthy um, and I have good relationship with them. And that creates a kind of intuitive felt sense. So it's a kind of like the symbol grounding felt sense where then even if they're in another environment where that's not true, and it was true in the little micro environment of their childhood, that's still the felt sense. And then they sometimes will keep that forever or they have to be disabused of it somewhat painfully at some point. Now, other people who have the general sense that most authorities are probably corrupt and um, probably abusing power and that most institutions can't be trusted and that people with less power can be more trusted – um, and that there is usually some process of corruption that is required for climbing power ladders. Those people generally weren't very successful at climbing the ladders early. And oftentimes had authorities around that abused power or that were like negative experience with them, whether it was parents or school or church or whatever it was. Not always, but I'm giving an example of a kind of bias that can occur, which is a towards or against authority bias, a kind of result that can happen, more likely to believe in conspiracies that the authorities are bad or more likely to reject that the authorities are bad, and a kind of developmental environment that could give rise to it. There's other developmental environments that could give rise to it, and there's other biases involved in conspiracy, but just one example of a developmental pathway. As far as the sense-making for the ongoing COVID situation goes, another principle that I'll share that I think is helpful and it will help you notice where you're, it'll, it'll help you make sense better, but it'll also help you notice where your own biases are is if you read something that seems compelling on a particular idea, like that immunity is conferred or immunity isn't conferred, try to find things that say the opposite that also seem the best thought out there are and see if you understand the arguments well enough to be able to parse the difference. And if not, don't hold a strong view on the topic. Um, so, Hey, the only way to get through this is herd immunity. That's the way that respiratory viruses work. So we need to keep the elderly inside, let everybody else go outside. It'll be fine. There won't be that many deaths because it's really mostly only for the elderly and the immunocompromised. And the only way we get through respiratory viruses is herd immunity. We've all heard some 
epidemiologist or pathologist or somebody say pretty confidently that. Well, are there some viruses that we don't get herd immunity to and we just really try to do everything we can to stop their transmission? Yeah, totally. Which one is this? We don't know yet. And uh, does it seem like a meaningful percentage of the people who get infected don't produce antibodies? Is there good evidence that people who are showing cleared are getting reinfected? Is that reinfected or is it a resurgence or was it a false test? Uh, does it seem like in the studies coming out of China that older people are producing three to five X the antibodies of younger people, which seems to be the opposite of what we'd expect, which makes us question what those antibodies will do. Will they, will they protect against getting it again where you won't get it at all? Will they protect where you still get it, but it's less severe, or might they actually prime a more severe response like happens with some things like dengue fever? Um, given that people who die are actually dying of excessive immune response, right? Cytokine storm responses or that a lot of evidence of that. If the antibodies are conferred, how long will they last? And um, given the decay rate on them and how much can we infer from other coronaviruses about this, which is a novel one. And, you know, you see different virologists saying uh, this is not mutating anywhere near as fast as influenza and doesn't have the same recombinatorial dynamics. It's probably uh, if we come up with a vaccine or people get immune, it'll be against, it'll be good. And then other ones saying, no, there's actually reasons to think that there's going to be a follow-up round, at least one, and it'll probably be more pathogenic. Before you decide which of those you believe, make sure that you study the dialectic well enough and understand it well enough that you can ground where you land in it. Um, that's, and so as soon as you read something compelling, just go search for the an antithesis and then see if you really understand it. I would say that is one just immediate obvious rule of thumb. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.